Hello everyone, welcome to The Biggest Ideas in the Universe. I'm your host, Sean Carroll. We're here for idea number 17, which is matter. By matter, I mean not what matters in life, but the matter that you and I are made of, the ground beneath our feet, the planets, the sun, the stars, things like that, the stuff out of which we are made. And uh, I'll admit that this represents a shift in the Biggest Ideas series for a couple of reasons. Uh, you know, we're not going to have an infinite number of Biggest Ideas videos. Sorry, there's a finite number. I had a plan when I started. The plan has shifted a little bit as we've gone on, but there is an ending point in sight. We're closer to the end than we are to the beginning. Sorry about that. So we're going to be finishing up with uh, a slightly different kind of ideas. We've, we've done a lot of work recently on building up quantum field theory and the standard model and gauge theories and things like that. And we have other fish to fry, as it were. So we're going to be less about that. This video will still be about quantum field theory, but it'll be about a more tangible aspect of quantum field theory. So the focus in the biggest ideas will always be conceptual. It will always be the big underlying ideas, not the nitty gritty of this and that. But now we're gonna get into things that are a little bit more relevant, a little bit more, not relevant, familiar, let us put it that way, easily grasped to us. Um, so even in this video on matter, uh, so, so what I should say is having said that, <laughs> even though this video is about matter, you might think, well, okay, it's gonna be about uh, materials and things like that and you know it's it's really not because I don't know anything about that stuff you should go to other people who know more about that uh, for those topics I want to connect some of the conversation we've been having about quantum field theory and the underlying laws of physics to the features of matter that we that make up you and me okay in particular most of today's idea is going to be a single feature of matter which is that it can be solid right? That a table is solid. You can't just put your hands on it and fall right through. This might not seem like uh, a question, but we'll ask it anyway. You know, why is matter solid? You might remember uh, back way back in one of the early videos, we were talking about the fact that just before quantum mechanics came on the scene, you could have imagined in the late 1800s, you could have imagined a version of physics where there were two different kinds of stuff. There were uh, particles that made up matter, you know, the particles that we would now know as the electron, the proton, and the neutron, and so forth. And there were forces that pushed and pulled the matter together. That's not exactly right, but there's a very close relative to that. And so today we're gonna explore the matter side. When we talked about gauge theories the other day, we were really talking about the forces side of things. So why is matter solid at all? Now, you might think, well, once you know about atoms and particles, this shouldn't be a difficult question. You know, if you have some uh, collection of atoms, you can just stack them on top of each other. Or maybe you could, uh, these are supposed to be atoms, not just bowling balls. Why can't you just stack things on? Or, of course, atoms can stick to each other, right, with chemical bonds, and you would imagine there is some solidity there. That, that makes sense. But then you remember, we're drawing atoms as little spheres. We know better, right? Atoms are not little spheres. Atoms are quantum objects. In particular, the size of the atom, as we talked about in the video on scale, is set by the Compton wavelength of the electron. It's really set by the Bohr radius, which is the Compton wavelength uh, divided by the fine structure constant. So the electron has a wave function, right? Uh, the electron wave function is wavy. It, it's sort of smooth and you could easily imagine deforming it. So the question is, why, can't, why aren't they squishy? Why aren't atoms squishy? This is one question. By which I mean, it looks like squashy. Let me make it look more like squishy. By which I mean, um, you could easily imagine didn't look like squashy, it looked like squashy. Uh, if I have two atoms like this, one right on top of each other, and I push them on the bottom and on the top, why don't they just squeeze down to more elliptical shapes so that they're much smaller, okay? Well, well, they're much smaller in one direction, maybe wider in some other direction. Why don't they just deform? They're just waves after all. And the answer is sort of implicit in what we talked about when we were talking about wave functions and uh, the shape of atoms in the first place, namely that the electron in a hydrogen atom or even a more complicated atom, its wave function has the shape it does because it's trying to minimize its energy, right? It's trying to minimize its energy subject to certain constraints. Maybe there are other electrons in the way, it's being attracted by the nucleus and so forth. 
So if you you can cert- you can imagine taking an atom and squishing it, there's no problem with imagining doing that, but its energy would change. And since its energy is already at the minimum, given the constraints it's subject to, the energy has to go up. You have to put energy into it. You might imagine that's not much energy, right? Like how much energy can it, can it take? You might, might be a squishy kind of springy thing. But in fact, it's a lot of energy. If you changed, you know, in a table, if you changed all the electrons' energies by 1%, that turns out to be an enormous amount of energy. I didn't actually calculate it. That's a good homework problem. I predict it would be something like an atomic bomb's worth of energy if you wanted to squish all the atoms in a table to change their electrons' energy by 1%. So there's a reason why electrons want to remain spherical in atoms. It's because they're in their lowest energy states already. It would take a lot of energy to change them. But there's another question. Uh, why don't they fall on top of each other. Why don't atoms go on top of each other? Why are they solid individually? So we say the tables are solid because they're made of little atoms, right? So that presumes that the atoms themselves have some ability to take up space, right? To occupy volume. So why can't we just imagine going from two atoms, pushing them together, and then this goes into one atom right on top of another one, right? What's, what's the danger of that? It's not quantum mechanics per se that is the problem there. There's no problem with having two electrons overlapping in their wave functions. I mean, electrons in an atom do that. But they don't do it arbitrarily. There are rules that they follow, and that's basically what we're going to be uh, talking about today in today's video. To give away the secret, which I like to do, we're going to be talk talking about the properties of fermions. Fermions are a certain kind of particle named after Enrico Fermi, famous Italian-American physicist, uh, and they are in contradistinction to bosons. And roughly speaking, uh, bosons named after Professor Bose, whose first name I can't pronounce, who's an Indian professor. So Bose hooked up with Einstein to invent Bose-Einstein statistics, which are particles of a certain kind, roughly speaking, particles that like to pile on top of each other. Particles that actually prefer to be in the same place, if you have identical particles of the same species, are bosons. Fermions obey what are called Fermi-Dirac statistics, after Fermi and Dirac, and they like to take up space. Fermions do not like to be on top of each other. So the glib answer to why atoms don't want to be on top of each other is because electrons, which are giving you the size of the atoms, are fermions. They take up space. They don't want to be on top of each other. But we want to get closer to why that's actually true. Okay. So the name of this principle that says why not is the Pau that, that says that this doesn't happen rather is the Pauli exclusion principle. So again, this is a uh, the fact the the motto electrons take up space is a very cute little retelling of the Pauli exclusion principle which is a precise quantitative statement which says that two electrons cannot be in exactly the same quantum state at the same time. Now, even the exclusion principle is, is less than there is to the story. There's more to it than that. But this is a nice, simple way of thinking about what's going on. If you imagine the shape of an electron wave function in an atom, if you tried to put two electrons in exactly the same state, which works out to be both the, sha the same shape for their wave function and also the same spin, you can't do that according to the Pauli exclusion principle. So that is what we want to get to. Uh, two fermions cannot occupy the same state, quantum state. Of course, it's a quantum state. What else would it be? We want to talk a little bit about why that's true, and also to give away some of the surprise at the end. Um, you may have heard fermions defined as particles that have a spin of one half or three halves or five halves, half integer spin, as we call. So bosons have spins of zero, one, two integer spins. That's true, but that's not the definition. There is a separate fact about fermions, which is that they have a spin of one half, uh, three halves, etc. But the defining principle of them is this. They do not take up the same quantum state. The connection between the taking up space and the having half integer spin is called the spin statistics theorem, and we'll talk a little bit about that in a somewhat unsatisfying way. Okay, so what is a fermion? That's what we got to get into here. 
And fermions, uh, well, we could just list all the ones we know. What is a fermion? They are either quarks. The ones we know are either quarks. So that's up, down, charm, strange, top, bottom. Or what we call the leptons, which are the electron, the muon, the tau. The muon and the tau are just heavier cousins of the electron. They're the same in every other way except for their mass. And then there are the neutrinos, and there's sort of one neutrino for each charged lepton. So there's an electron neutrino, a muon neutrino, and a tau neutrino. These are all the fermions that we know about. Let me think. I hope I'm not uh, skipping any. It's always hard to actually remember when you're a, a working physicist because there's so many hypothetical fermions that we almost take for granted they exist, uh, but these are the ones we actually know. These are the fermions of the standard model of particle physics. And what makes them fermions? Okay, um, consider two particles. So we're going to consider the quantum mechanical wave function for two particles. And part of the whole discourse we're going to have through this video is that we're going to remember that deep down we're talking about quantum field theory, okay? But we're not going to really do any quantum field theory. So we're going to work with particles as if they're original, uh, uh, official particles all by themselves. But we remember in the back of our minds that what these particles are are a certain way of talking about quantum fields in what we call low energy states, right? The lowest energy state is zero particles. The slightly higher energy state is one particle, and there are states with two particles, three particles, etc. So we're talking about particles, but they come from quantum fields, and that will actually matter. So what does the wave function for two particles look like? And forget about spin and things like that. We're not going to go into those quite yet. We'll get there eventually. So the wave function, capital Psi, for two particles just depends on where they are. Particle 1 is at x1, and particle 2 is at x2, let's say, for example, OK? There you go. We're not going to say what it is yet, but we're going to derive some properties of the wave function for two quantum particles. And in fact, let's imagine these are identical particles. Oops. Identical. Why would we imagine that? Well, um, they don't have to be. There are particles that are not identical. A proton and an electron are not identical. But two electrons are identical particles. Now, why are they identical particles? We're going to refer back to the fact that they come from quantum field theory. Two electrons in two different places are two different vibrations in the same underlying field. So of course they are identical. Their, their particleness is not what makes up nature. Fieldness is what makes up nature. And it's the same field that is giving rise to these two electrons the same exact properties of the field. So of course, the particles that we get by looking at vibrations in the electron field will be identical particles. So that is something that we inherit from the fact that it's really quantum fields going on. And now we want to ask, well, what happens if we exchange the two particles with each other? The thing to remember here is that x1 and x2 are not specific locations in space, right? They're what we call the argument of the wave function. So they're two different labels on our three-dimensional space, one of which says, what is the likelihood of finding particle 1 there? And the other one says particle 2. So you see that already something interesting is going on if the particles are identical. I mean, how do you know which one you've seen if you actually measure it? Have you seen particle 1 or particle 2? So there's probably some relationship that relates x1 and x2 to each other in the wave function. Or, or rather, what we could say is there's got to be some feature of this function psi that relates x1 and x2 to each other, because we don't know when we measure a particle which one it is we're actually measuring, because they're just vibrations in the field. So a way to think about this is to imagine uh, interchanging. What if we, oops, what if we exchange the two particles? So let's send psi of x1 comma x2 to something which we're going to call the interchange operator. So you know this is something that takes the wave function and switches the two particles. So the interchange operator acting on psi of x1 and x2, which guess what is going to be equal to psi of x2 comma x1 as a function. So again, mathematicians are going to be a little bit annoyed by this notation, but you know what I mean is, is the hope, okay? And we want to figure out what this actually means, wh what this, what properties this should have. So there are two things we know about this, just on the basis of quantum mechanics, 
okay? Uh, one thing that we know is that if you interchange the two particles and then you interchange them again, you get back where you started, okay? Nothing actually happened. So one thing is that the interchange operator, the act of switching the two particles, if that were to act on what you get by acting on the interchange operator, if this reminds you of our group theory discussion, that's probably not a coincidence, this is a, a set of transformations you can do on this uh, wave function, then you act that on psi of x1 comma x2, you better get back where you started. So that is psi of x1 comma x2. You didn't do anything. You switched them and you switched them back. That seems kind of obvious and not worth noting, but believe me, we're going to have to note it. Uh, the other thing that we know is that if you only interchange once, so if you just do the interchange on psi x1 and x2, because they are the same, because they are identical particles, because they are vibrations in the same underlying quantum field, there can't be any observable consequence of doing this. Okay, And this is where quantum mechanics comes in, because quantum mechanics distinguishes between what is real and what you can observe. You can't observe the wave function directly, right? What can you observe? You can actually measure to see is the particle at x1 or x2. So basically what you can measure is the probability of uh, measuring particles there when you look. That's what you can calculate. That's what you care about. That's the quantity that gives you observable predictions is the probability. So this better equal the same physical situation because they're identical particles, interchanging the two shouldn't change the physical situation. And what that means is that the probability of observing a particle at x1 and x2 is, of course, capital Psi of x1 comma x2 magnitude squared. So this thing, therefore, Psi squared doesn't change. So let, let, me, let me write it in a little bit more formal way of, of saying it. Psi squared equals whatever you get by interchanging psi and then squaring that. This is the requirement that the physical situation, the predictions, the observable outcome does not change if you interchange two identical particles with each other. Okay. So then you have two possibilities. There are two ways to satisfy these two things we know. One is if you do interchanging twice, nothing happens. What the other is if you interchanging only once, you better make the same physical predictions. So there's two possible, two ways to satisfy these two criteria. One is the obvious way, okay. Uh, if you interchange, I'm just gonna write int from now on rather than the whole word interchange. If you interchange psi x1 and x2, Maybe you just get back psi x1, x2. Maybe nothing happens to it at all, okay? This would be the intuitive non-quantum mechanical thing. If you had two identical particles and you switch them for each other and you know, so you did, someone did that while you weren't looking, you wouldn't know, right? It looks exactly the same. Maybe it does, looks exactly the same because it is exactly the same. That is absolutely a possibility, and this possibility is realized in quantum mechanics, and we call particles that obey this relation bosons. That's what bosons are. Bosons are particles for which when you have two identical ones, if you switch them in the wave function, the wave function doesn't change at all. So just to make that clear, for example, e.g., for some psi of one particle. Okay, so imagine now someone gives you a wave function of just a single particle. I can instantly create a wave function for two bosonic particles that satisfies these criteria, right? I can let capital psi of x1, x2 be just psi of x1 times psi of x2. This is a perfectly good bosonic wave function. Note that if this first wave function were different than that one, then in general this would not be a good uh, wave function for a bosonic particle, because if I switch them it would not get the same answer. So more generally, for two different 
functions uh, little psi 1 and little psi 2, I can make a bosonic wave function, capital psi, by taking psi 1 of x1, psi 2 of x2, but then adding plus psi 2 of x1, psi 1 of x2, okay? And these are just numbers, psi 1, x2. They're numbers for every value of uh, x1 and x2. So they commute and everything like that. There's nothing funny business going on. But by construction, by the way that we made this particular wave function, it will always be the case that we've satisfied uh, these two criteria. You interchange twice and you don't change anything. You interchange once and you make the same uh, probability exactly because, in fact, you just get the same exact wave function when you interchange. That's automatic no matter what the specific function psi1 and psi2 here are. So bosons are allowed physical particles and the bosons of the standard model are photons and gluons and W and Z bosons and the Higgs boson and the graviton. There you go. Graviton, you can debate whether it counts, but it counts. So what this means is that there is no objection to two different identical bosons having the same exact quantum state. And in fact, what Bose showed is that they like to have the same quantum state. Given one boson just sitting there in some quantum state, another one actually likes to cuddle up with it. You know, they like to be sociable. They like to be right on top of each other doing exactly the same thing. That's what bosons like to do. So bosons can pile onto each other. And therefore, this has a very, very important dramatic effect in macroscopic world physics. They can give rise to long range macroscopic forces, okay? The reason why you could discover the gravitational field or the electromagnetic field as big classical fields long before you had discovered gravitons or photons is because gravitons and photons are bosons and they can pile on top of each other to give you a strong detectable field in the classical regime. So they can give rise, they don't always necessarily, but they can give rise to macroscopic classical fields. Gravity and electromagnetism are mediated by bosons. Now, the strong force is also mediated by bosons. Gluons are very happy to pile on, but because of confinement, they don't ever escape the proton or the neutron, so we don't see them. The weak force, W and Z bosons, also happy to pile on, just like the Higgs boson, also happy to pile on, but those particles are so massive they just decay away very quickly. So the massless, non-confined bosonic fields can give rise to long-range macroscopic force fields, and guess what? That's exactly what they do. You shouldn't be surprised. Okay, there's another way to satisfy these two criteria. Here are the criteria. Interchange once and you get the same probability but not necessarily the same state. Interchange twice and you get the same quantum state. Well, you're going to guess what it is. You're going to guess correctly. Uh, the other way to satisfy it is that interchanging psi of x1, x2 gets you minus psi of x1, x2. If you only knew this second criterion, that you interchange once and you get the same probability, then you would say, well, okay, any complex phase, e to the i theta, could multiply the wave function when I exchange two particles. But you really want the wave function to be exactly unchanged when you do it twice. So it really needs to be multiplying by minus one is the only possibility. By the way, footnote here, uh, nothing that we say in this video is rigorous. Uh, sometimes I'm able to take a rigorous argument and give you uh, a version of it that is understandable and transferable and makes sense. This whole subject is one in which there are rigorous arguments, but they're just difficult. They're just intrinsically difficult even to say in words. So I'm offering plausibility arguments more than anything else. So sticklers will know that you know whether or not uh, bosons and fermions are the only kinds of fields depends on the number of dimensions of space-time, for example, which you're not mentioning here. But if you if space-time were three-dimensional instead of four-dimensional, we'd be telling a very different story. But we're we're just taking the shortcuts here to give you. We're, we want you to understand why this makes sense, not necessarily to rigorously know that it's been proven true. Okay, those are our standards. So this. This is another way that you can satisfy the criteria that we settled, and this way is called fermions. This is what fermions do. Fermions are particles for which, in a multiparticle wave function, when you exchange two of them, the wave function picks up a minus sign. 
That's the real definition of what fermions are, okay? So that means they can't be in the same state. So for example, uh, you could make a fermionic state, psi x1 of x2 and x2, which is equal to some function psi1 of x1 times some other function psi2 of x2 minus psi2 of x1, psi1 of x2, okay? So now you notice, just by this version of this formulation of how I wrote the wave function, that if I let x1 go to x2, the wave function as a whole picks up a minus sign. That's what fermions are supposed to do. And then you also notice that if psi1 equals psi2 as functions, then this capital psi would have to equal zero. You can't make a wave function by multiplying two one particle wave functions together and then anti-symmetrizing in this way if the two wave functions are identical unless the whole thing is just exactly zero. So this is the way that we have to derive the fact that fermions, uh, that this is, it gives us the Pauli exclusion principle. Let me just say it that way. This says that two particles cannot be in the same state. Pauli exclusion principle. Pauli, by the way, is just one of the heroes of early quantum mechanics. Uh, he didn't quite get there to invent matrix mechanics or the Schrodinger equation, but he invented a lot of stuff. He was also like really difficult to get along with. You know, he was very uh, notorious for telling other people how stupid they were. Sometimes the other people were actually correct, and then he would go on and develop their ideas and get credit for them. So like, it was Pauli's students, I think who first suggested the idea of spin, and he said that they were idiots and they shouldn't do that, and someone else showed that spin was really there, and Pauli developed the whole spin matrices and everything about spin that we now know and love today. So he was smart, but you know, even smart people are not always right. Anyway, the exclusion principle, very, very important. So this is anti-symmetry, right? This is an anti-symmetric wave function. It implies that psi one cannot equal psi two, but they can be different. So you can have two fermions in two different states, and then the total wave function would look like this. And if you want to say, oh, that, that looks like they're entangled with each other, yeah, that's exactly right. You know, two identical particles have to be entangled in this way. Two fermions have to be entangled in this way. Uh, two bosons can just be right on top of each other in exactly the same state, which would not be entangled. But fermions always got to be entangled, okay. Okay, so uh, this means, in other words, that fermions take up space. That's what we've learned. Because they cannot be, two fermions cannot have exactly the same wave function, one way or the other. And that is why atoms are uh, solid. Because, you know, this is, again, simplification, because there's something like spin that we're going to talk about in a second. But roughly speaking, if you imagine two hydrogen atoms, okay, two protons with a single electron around them, and you tried to put them right on top of each other, those two electrons would want to be in the same quantum state. But the Pauli exclusion principle says they can't, okay? Uh, it's a better example with helium atoms, but, you know, we've, we've done hydrogen more than helium, so let's just talk about that, okay? So this is usually called, so bosons versus fermions, uh, that, that, classification, that classification is known as the statistics of the particles. They, this uh, distinction first became noticeable when, or noticed when people, Bose and Einstein, Fermi and Dirac, were actually thinking about large collections of many, many particles. And then the fact that the particles either want to take up space or pile on top of each other clearly affects the statistical likelihood that they're going to be in different quantum mechanical states, okay? So Bose-Fermi statistics, the word statistics is what is used to say whether or not a particle is a boson or a fermion. Does it obey Bose statistics or does it obey Fermi statistics? And bosons, this is a little bit redundant, but I'm saying it anyway, just to stick in. Bosons give rise to forces, fermions give rise to matter. Now what we said was that to obey our two rules for what happens when you interchange two particles, there were two options. You could either be bosonic or fermionic. There's no in-between. Um, there's no rule that says that a theory needs to have both, but of course the standard model of particle physics certainly does. Supersymmetry is a hypothetical symmetry that tries to relate bosons to fermions. It says that there is a symmetry transformation in nature 
that maps a bosonic field to a fermionic field and vice versa. The standard model is clearly not supersymmetric. There is no mapping of the fermion fields onto the boson fields that, that satisfies any symmetry. But you could imagine that like the electroweak symmetry, supersymmetry is broken spontaneously. And so for every fermion, there is a, a partner, which is a boson and vice versa, but they're just too heavy because remember symmetry breaking often gives mass to particles. So maybe all the super partners are just so heavy that we haven't observed them yet. And then in nature, you could actually be supersymmetric. Now we were hoping to see supersymmetric particles at the Large Hadron Collider. We didn't. So therefore, as a good Bayesian, your credence that supersymmetry is correct should go down. But you know, if you didn't have hopes and dreams for the electroweak scale and the Large Hadron Collider, there's nothing to prevent you from saying that supersymmetry is broken at a much higher energy scale. So the fact that we haven't seen supersymmetry at the LHC is evidence against supersymmetry existing, but it's nowhere near definitive evidence. It's very, very easy to come up with supersymmetric theories where the supersymmetry is hidden from us and we'll never see it within my lifetime anyway. So we don't know about that. But the standard model certainly does not have um, supersymmetry in it. Anyway, uh, you often hear, you are often told that bosons have spin of 0, 1, 2, dot, 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 some integer, and fermions have spin of 1 half, ah, I was thinking while writing again, 3 halves, five halves, etc. okay? So as I said, as I uh, uh, foreshadowed, this is, this is a true fact, but it is not the definition of what a boson and fermion is. Bosons take up, uh, like to pile on top of each other, fermions take up space, fermions have the Pauli exclusion principle, bosons actually like to be, are more likely to be where other bosons are. So we want to relate, we want to uh, figure out why this is true, right? Why is it the bosons are spin zero, one, two, Fermions are spin one half, three halves, five halves. So I guess I will have to tell you uh, what the definition of spin is. We'll have to talk a little bit about spin. Now we've been fearlessly talking about spin uh, already because it's one of those words you've heard before. Um, let me pause to, to say something that is real, not in the textbooks, but I think is true. So people talk about spin as a, as a, a version of angular momentum, okay? Elementary particles, like the electron or quarks or the photon or whatever, have spin. And you can transform angular momentum in the good old-fashioned sense, like an electron moving with angular momentum around a proton in an atom, to spin and vice versa. So what we call orbital angular momentum, good old angular momentum that you would measure by something moving around, is this part of the same conserved quantity that spin is, okay? So spin is definitely, unambiguously, clearly a kind of angular momentum. Otherwise, angular momentum would not be conserved. So you should think of spin as angular momentum. However, people will tell you, do not think of spin as something actually spinning. Do not think of an electron as actually having a, a rotation around some axis. And if you say, well, why not? Why shouldn't I think of that? They will say, well, look, uh, the electron is a point particle, okay? It would have to be spinning literally infinitely fast in order for it to have any angular momentum at all by the formula for angular momentum, okay? Uh, but it, it can't be spinning infinitely fast because that would be faster than the speed of light. That would make no sense. In other words, the idea that the electron is a point particle seems to be incompatible with it having intrinsic spin. Um, another way of saying it is, well, even if you don't believe the electron has is a point particle, or even if you if you say, well, the electron really is a wave function, not a point particle, um, the wave function has a size, you know, the Compton wavelength, for example. And if you have if you make a sphere, a solid sphere, the Compton wavelength of the electron, and you let it rotate, then you can figure out that it would again have to be rotating faster than the speed of light to have the spin that the electron really has, spin one half. But neither one of those. Neither one of those arguments should be convincing to you at all, because you know that really the electron is an excitation in a quantum field. And you might ask, you know, can fields have angular momentum? Even if they're not literally moving, can the configuration of a field have angular momentum? The answer is yes. In fact, magnetic fields, all just sitting there all by themselves, can have angular momentum. 
So what you really should be asking is, can the configuration of the electron field have the angular momentum of one half that we would give to it by uh, the ordinary way of talking about spin? So the answer seems to be yes. Uh, my colleague at Caltech, Chip Siebens, who I wrote a paper with about Everettian quantum mechanics that is completely uh, orthogonal to this, has been working on understanding field, uh, spin in quantum field theory. And his understanding, which seems completely correct to me, is that you can think of spin as literally the angular momentum of the field describing the electron or the quark or whatever. So my slightly heterodox opinion, following what Chip has done, is to say that you should think of spin as angular momentum because it is, because there literally is something spinning, but it's the field. It's not some uh, notion of an elementary particle that is point-like in any way. Okay. Um, so, it, you know, in other words, remember Nerder, Emmy Nerder. Oops. Ah, not a good day. All right. She said that conserved quantities, well, sorry, she said it the other way around. She says that symmetries imply conserved quantities. So, for example, the U1 gauge invariance of electromagnetism implies conservation of electric charge. Um, translation invariance in one direction of space implies conservation of linear momentum. Time translation invariance implies conservation of energy. And it is rotational invariance that implies conservation of angular momentum. And when you go through the details of what's going on, um, you can show that fields can have transformation properties under rotations. And you, you sort of know this. Uh, if you just have a scalar field, like a scalar field is just a number at every point in space, under a rotation, nothing happens to it. It's a number at that point. I do a rotation around that point. The field doesn't care. It's just sitting there. But if I have a vector field, okay, a vector field points in a direction. So if I'm sitting at one point and I rotate my coordinates, the components of the vector better change to compensate for the fact that I'm changing my coordinates. So when we think about how a field changes under rotations of the coordinates, different kinds of fields can be different. And that's a question you can ask. What are the transformation properties under rotations of the particular field we're looking at? And the answer tells you the spin, okay? So spin is the transformation, or comes from, let's put it this way, let's put an arrow that way, the transformation properties of fields under spatial rotations. As you might guess or fear or anticipate we're not going to go into details about this okay but i'm telling you this is the the true thing so you can derive equations for what the spin of different fields are using the properties that they have under rotations uh, in space and you can relate the, and you can show that spin plus orbital angular momentum is the thing that is conserved according to Noether's theorem it is the total conserved angular momentum so let's go through some examples there uh scalars scalar fields which i just said uh, scalars don't change. I just said that in words and I moved my hands, but let's just draw a little picture, okay? So what I mean is here is space. So this is X and Y, and let's focus in on the value of some scalar field at this point right there, phi, okay? And I undergo a rotation, rotate by anything at all. It doesn't matter what angle I do. And at the end of the day, uh, I suppose I should draw my axes rotated a little bit. Uh, phi is the same thing. Phi is the same. It hasn't changed. So the there's a slight inconsistency in the labeling here, but it, but it all works out for reasons that we're not going to go into. We call this spin zero. It doesn't transform at all. We don't, we don't give it any spin, and that is what pops out of the mathematics as well. Okay, so that's one possibility. Another possibility is vectors. So it's a little complicated. We'd have to go into matrices and, and SO3 and things like that if we wanted to tell you in all glory how vectors change under rotations. But let's simplify our lives and look at rotations by 360 degrees, okay? Rotation all the way around, right? You're going you're gonna to anticipate this is going to be boring because when you rotate by 360 degrees, nothing should happen. 
but aha, you're going to be surprised. So vectors don't change. For a vector, you're right, okay? For vectors, they don't change under 360 degree rotation. That's 2 pi if you're a radians person, okay? But I'm trying to be user-friendly to the degrees people under there, out there. So here is, again, space. Here is my little vector. I'm gonna draw my vector pointing up. I'm gonna rotate, so this is a rotation by 360 degrees. And what happens? Nothing at all. I mean, something happens in between, but once I've done the entire rotation by 360, I go back to exactly where I started, okay? So we call this spin one. It has unit spin. So really, when I say one, I really mean one equals h bar. h bar, Planck's constant, which we set equal to one, turns out dimensionally, if you don't use natural units, h bar has units of spin. And a spin one particle, the amount of spin that it has is exactly equal to h bar. That's why the two pi is there. That's why we define uh, h bar is h over two pi, because this way you get a nice formula for the relationship between h and spin. So you can talk about spin one rather than, uh, I don't know, spin one over two pi, it would be uh, something like that. Yeah, uh, no, spin two pi, I guess, yeah. Spin one is much easier to say. Okay, there are fields like let's say the gravitational field okay the remember we talked about the metric tensor field uh we're not going to go into details here again but there are fields that have the property uh there exist fields that have the property that they're invariant let me just, let me be consistent with what i said before they don't change when you under when you rotate by just 180 degrees which is just pi radians, okay? So how could that be if I'm drawing my little picture here, if I draw anything other than a dot, like when I drew my vector, uh, clearly if I rotated that by 180, it'd be pointing down now. So what can I do? Well, what I can do is just draw something that is symmetric, right? So I'm drawing something that looks like it points both up and down, and then I'm gonna rotate that by 180 degrees. And if it's truly symmetric up and down then that's going to look exactly the same before and after okay and in fact that is more so sorry this is called spin two and you can go on uh to higher things 360 degrees for spin one 180 degrees for spin two 360 degrees divided by three 120 degrees for spin three etc um, and gravitons are spin two, photons and W and Z bosons are spin one, Higgs bosons are spin zero, so all of these are actually uh, realized in, in the real world, okay? And interestingly, you can actually see this behavior or uh, sort of a reflection of this behavior in the classical influence of these fields. You know, if you compare, I said spin one photons would be an example, electromagnetism, spin two gravity, right? So think about what happens to particles as one of these classical waves goes by. Um, a photon, goes, uh, an electromagnetic field goes by, electromagnetic wave, or a gravitational wave goes by. Well, what happens is for uh, an E&M wave, electromagnetic, if I imagine that the electromagnetic wave is coming at you, or coming at me, coming out of the board, okay, uh, so... And here are here is a charged particle like an electron, uh, and here is the x and y axis, and so the particle, the wave rather, is moving in the z direction, so it's coming at you. What's going to happen? Well, the electron, the electric field, the electric field is going to be pointing up, and then a moment later, it's going to be pointing down. If that's so, this is e two. If that's e one, so the electron's motion is up and then down. It vibrates in a vertical direction. And this, we know this, if you, if you know a little bit about E&M, uh, this is the polarization of that electromagnetic wave. If you, if you wear polarized sunglasses, they will let through electromagnetic waves of one polarization, but not the perpendicular polarization. So there's a relationship between the fact that the field is invariant under 360 degrees, which means it's either pointing up you have to go all the way around before it's pointing down again. And the fact that when the field oscillates, a particle under the influence of that 
goes up and down. So it's, it's uh, invariant under a rotation by 180 degrees. Whereas for a gravitational wave, what happens? And you might think if I have a little test mass sitting there, x, y, and the gravitational wave goes by in the z direction, well, it will also move the particle up and down. That's what a wave should do, right? Turns out that's not right. It's a little bit trickier than that. And the reason why is because, remember, the principle of equivalence, when we talked about gravity in the last video, uh, if I have a bunch of particles, I can't compare them to each other if they all just move in the same direction. All I can do is ask how they move relative to each other. So if the particles did move up and down in lockstep, then I wouldn't have a gravitational wave at all. That's equivalent to nothing happening. That's equivalent to just changing my point of view, right? Whereas with the charged particle, I could put a charged particle next to an uncharged particle. I could literally see it move up and down. But because of the principle of equivalence for gravity, they all move up or they all move down. So that's not really motion at all. Um, what I can do is imagine that I have a series of particles. Again, these imagine these are like test particles floating in outer space. Okay, So they're not pulling or put pushing on each other. They're just floating out there. A gravitational wave goes by. And what can happen is the shape can be distorted. That is something that is measurable. If all of the particles were to move in lockstep, that wouldn't be measurable. But if they change their shape with respect to each other, that is measurable. So what actually happens is this kind of arrangement will uh, change over time into something that is more stretched out, like this, OK? And then it will oscillate back to this circular configuration. And then it will oscillate to being stretched out this way. So in other words, the uh, overall effect of the gravitational wave passing by can be thought of as forming a plus pattern. Right? You see the plus sign there? That is the actual pattern. Not the most beautiful drawing of this pattern. Okay, let me draw that. Let me do that again. You know, this is going to be on YouTube for like a million years, right? They're never going to take this down, so I better get it, make it pretty. So here's a circle. Yep, there, make it a circle. Uh, now I can make an ellipse. Look at that. Now I make another ellipse. Look at that. Okay, not the prettiest ellipses ever, but still, not, not bad. Uh, can I move it? Yeah, there we go. So this is supposed to represent the set of particles moving in this plus pattern, up and down like that. And there, that's one polarization of the gravitational wave. The other polarization is called the X pattern, or the times pattern, where here's a circle. So this is the position of some test particles. And they vibrate, oops, and they vibrate this way into this kind of ellipse, tilted, and then into this kind of ellipse, tilted the other way. I made a square. <laughs> <laughs> without wanting to. How about that? Is that an ellipse? Yes. Good. Can I move it? Yeah, there you go. Good enough. So this is vibrating in an X pattern. There's still polarizations, two polarizations of the gravitational wave, but look, they're related to each other by um, it looks like just a 45 degree offset rather than the uh, 90 degree offset of the two polarizations of the electromagnetic wave. So this these features, all of which is to say, in a very long-winded way, uh, these two features, these features of the classical waves in electromagnetism and gravity, are a reflection of the fact that the underlying quantum fields are spin 1 for electromagnetism, spin 2 for gravity. Okay, there you go. You could also imagine a polarization where a bunch of test particles under gravity just sort of expanded and contracted. They didn't get deformed at all. Uh, that would be measurable. That would correspond to a spin zero graviton, which we don't think exists, but you could imagine it. You could have theories of big scalar fields that actually would pull particles, a breathing mode for the particles going in and out, okay? All right, all of that. See, I get enthusiastic and I get uh, distracted from the actual matter at hand. The matter at hand is fermions, right? So that was just spin zero, spin one, spin two. Those are all the bosons. Where are the fermions going to come from? I mean, if if a boson with spin 1 already has the feature, where is it, uh, that it doesn't change, it's left invariant under 360 degrees, 
and higher spins are invariant under fewer and fewer degrees, then less spin, less than spin one, is gonna be invariant under more than 360 degrees. So, of course, if it's something is invariant under a rotation by 360, it will also be invariant under a rotation by 720, which is twice 360. But how in the world can something be invariant only under a rotation by 720 without also being invariant under a rotation by 360, right? So it seems that spin 1 half should be invariant under, if we go by the pattern we've already established, under a rotation by 720 degrees, 4 pi, but not by a rotation under just 360 degrees. So how is that even possible? Okay, um, well, so let me just state that it is possible and it's going to happen. So let psi of x be what we call a spinner field. Spinner with an OR at the end. So this is in contrast with, this is a vector field, this is a tensor field, a particular kind of tensor field, the graviton, okay. There is something called a spinner, and this is a spinner field that has the property that a rotation uh, by 360 degrees acting on psi of x gives us minus psi of x. There's a family resemblance there between this and fermions, right? But it is different. Number one, the fermion statement was about quantum wave functions, not about classical fields. Number two, they were interchanging two separate particles, and this is a, uh, a statement about the single classical field, what is it's happening under rotations. Um, and then, of course, rotation by 720 degrees acting on psi of x. We know that had better give back the original psi of x, because it's just two rotations by 360. All right. So how is that even possible, uh, is the question. How is it possible to have a thing, a geometric object, which is invariant under rotations by 720, but not by 360? So we're going to have a visual aid. We almost never have visual aids here on The Biggest Ideas in the Universe, but this is a special occasion. So here is my Schrodinger's cat mug. Okay, you can get these yourself. Uh, I think this is the Unemployed Philosopher's Guild. Yes, Unemployed Philosopher's Guild sells the Schrodinger cat mugs. They come in pairs. You put hot water in them and you see whether you have the mug where the cat is alive or the cat is dead. I, I was not in charge, so it's not sleeping and awake cats. Uh, but anyway, you don't know and it doesn't really matter for the purposes of this particular visual demonstration. Here's the demonstration. You can see this. This is a famous demonstration. I didn't invent it. Uh, Richard Feynman has done this very famously and other people have done it. And the, the demonstration is the following. What we want to do is, if you just consider the cup, the mug, then clearly if you rotate it around the vertical axis by 360 degrees, it comes back to the state it was in originally, okay? There's nothing weird about that. Uh, but we're trying to challenge the idea that everything in the universe has the property that if you rotate it by 360 degrees, it comes back to the state it's in. Are there things that you have to rotate them by 720? And the answer is yes. And the thing that you have to, the thing that remains invariant under rotation by 720 degrees is not the cup, but the relationship between the cup and me, okay? This is an abstract concept, but this is what you're paying for. The relationship between the cup and me changes if I only rotate the cup by 360, but does not change. It goes back to where it originally was if I rotate it by 720, okay? And the demonstration of this is me holding it in my hand and rotating the cup around a vertical axis. So I'm not allowed to do this. That's cheating. Cup is empty. Don't worry. But I'm not allowed to, trying to hold this where it's visible, uh, not allowed to tilt it. So I need to keep it um, vertical and I rotate it. So let's see what happens. So I can rotate it without breaking my arm, uh, keeping it vertical. And you see it is now rotated by 360 degrees, but it's clearly in a different relationship. But I can keep rotating it and it goes back to where it started. Okay. So you can wind the video back. I rotated it in the same sense. I did not unwind it. That would have been cheating. I rotated it by 720 degrees, and I got back to where I started. And it turns out, we're not going to go into the details here, it turns out that this is a reflection of the following math fact. Pi 1 of SO3 equals Z2. 
See, you thought that all that uh, work trying to understand topology was just sort of a mathematical diversion. It was not. Uh, the SO3 is the group of rotations in three dimensions. Pi 1 of SO3 is the set of ways that we can map a circle, that is to say a continuous path that is a closed loop into the set of rotations. And what this is saying is that here's a rotation by, you know, one degree, two degrees, three degrees, etc. Go, you can go all the way back to 360 degrees and then keep going it again and come back to where you started. And that is a topologically uh, non-trivial thing you can do. So the, I guess the way to say it is, it's, again, this is not very clear, sorry, but uh, it's not going to be clear. The point is that what you might have thought was a uh, topologically tri non-trivial thing, in fact, is not. You have to go around twice to make it topologically trivial. That's what this is saying. There are ways of doing rotations that if you do them twice, you get back to where you started. That's, that's this particular mathematical statement. Okay, so um, th here is a field that is invariant. There, there could exist fields that are invariant under rotations by 720 degrees. We would call them spin one half in comparison to what we already said about spin one and spin two, okay? And um, they exist in nature. Electrons and quarks and so forth all, all have spin one half. We've never discovered a particle with spin three halves uh, an elementary particle, you can make them by combining, you know, a spin one particle with a spin one half particle, but that's cheating a little bit. Of the elementary particles that we know of, they're either spin zero, one half, one, or two if you count the graviton. In supersymmetry, if there is a supersymmetric partner for the graviton, it would be called the gravitino, and it would have spin three halves. But again, no evidence for that actually existing right now. So let me say a bit more about how spin works, and then we'll relate it in a triumphant conclusion. We will relate it to uh, fermions and bosons. So the other thing I want to say is that you can measure spin. And a classic example is an electron. If you send an electron through a properly stretched magnetic field, it will be deflected upward if the spin is spin up and downward if the spin is spin down. That is called the stern gerlach experiment. So when you measure spin, there's a feature of quantum mechanics that says you're only going to get quantized answers. Uh, you're not going to get any answer. And this is, this is what was so weird about the stern gerlach experiment, right? So you have a magnetic field. Let me draw the stern gerlach experiment. This is how you measure the uh, spin of an electron or another charged spinning particle. You can find more details in my book, Something Deeply Hidden, about the stern gerlach experiment. So you have uh, a magnet, which is inhomogeneous. So I'm going to draw it. So here is the north pole of the magnet, and it comes to a point. And here is the south pole of the magnet, which is sort of roundish. And then the magnetic field does things like this. So it's squished at one end. And then I send an electron through it. Okay. And you might think, well, okay, if the electron has spin, it will be deflected. So the, the electron is basically a little magnet, okay? Because it's a charged particle that is spinning, when you start charges spinning, you get magnets. So you're not surprised the electron is deflected. And if you say it's spin one half, you might say, well, okay, it'll be either, uh, if its axis is exactly aligned with the magnetic field, it'll be deflected one way. If it's anti-aligned, it'll be deflected the other way. And if it's somewhere in between, it will be deflected somewhere in between. But what actually happens is it's only ever deflected up or down, never in the middle. So this is what we call spin up, and this is what we call spin down. And these are the measurement outcomes uh, for this particular electron. So the real electron before you measure it could very well be in a superposition of spin up and spin down. But just like Schrodinger's cat, the electron, once you look at it, will only be seen to be in one state or another, spin up or spin down. So that's a feature more generally of spin, that you will only observe certain quantized answers, and the answers that you get will be separated by spin one, by one unit of spin. So these are different by one unit of spin, of angular momentum if you like, because this spin up is plus one half, the electron is spin one half, this spin down is minus one half, okay? So that's more general. That's true for any set of any spinning particle. You will observe its spin to be certain quantized numbers, and the numbers you're allowed to get are separated by units of one, units of h bar, units of the fundamental Planck constant, okay? So for spin zero, what you can get, you'll always get the same answer. There'll be no deflection in the magnetic field. So what we'll draw is just, uh, 
This is the spin that we're measuring. It's zero, and you will always get that. So there is the thing that you will measure compared to zero. It is zero. Good. No surprise. There's only one allowed value of the spin. For spin one, sorry, let's do spin one half, which we're just doing up here. Now, this is spin zero, but you never get that. You never observe spin zero for a spin one half particle. You either observe plus one half or minus one half. So that is two possible values for the spin. For spin one, now you can measure zero. In other words, the, the, the spin might be along, so I should say perpendicular to the magnetic field. And so it's not gonna be deflected at all, or it could be deflected up or down. So you can measure it up here, down there, you get spin zero, plus one or minus one, three allowed values for the spin, okay? There you go. So this is what you would actually measure in an experiment. This is how spin works. All of that long rigmarole was to say, there's something called spin. It's a variety of angular momentum. It's quantized in quantum mechanics. And its quantum values uh, are such that the allowed values that you can measure come in half integer units. For any one kind of particle, the allowed values you will ever actually see are separated by units of one h bar, okay? So, good. Now, I haven't mentioned fermions or bosons, right? In, in a long time, I've been mentioning spin, and so I wanted to drive home the idea that what makes you a fermion is whether or not you obey the Pauli exclusion principle, whether or not you take up space. And what makes you a particle with spin is that there's some value of the angular momentum that you can measure and it's quantized. But there is a relationship, okay? The spin statistics theorem, it's called. You know what spin is. And remember, statistics is, are you a boson or are you a fermion? And the spin statistic theorem is, uh, bosons have spin, zero, one, two, dot, dot, dot. Fermions, are half integer spin. One half, three halves, five halves, etc. Okay. Why is there this theorem? So this is another example of a true fact in physics that you can prove mathematically and it's sort of notoriously difficult to explain why this is true. Uh, you can prove it through very dense mathematics, but boiling the essence of the proof down to something people can understand it turns out to be very, very difficult. And people have tried, and as soon as you come up with a clever explanation, someone who really understands the proof says, well, here's a counterexample to your proposed explanation. So I'm not going to try to prove it. I'm not even going to try to give you reason behind the proof, what I'll do is what everyone else does, and I will provide you with an argument that will make you think it's not surprising, okay? So all I'm trying to do here is to make you think that it is plausible there's a relationship between this fact, which, which has to do with the interchange of two particles, and this fact, which has to do with the rotations of single particles, right? Bosons and fermions say what happens when you change two particles with each other, interchange. R spin is, says what do you do when you take a single particle and rotate it. They're clearly, in, in the math that we did, seems to be some resemblance there, but they're also clearly independent concepts, so how do we relate them to each other? So we have a second uh, demonstration. Look at this. Two different visual aids in the same big idea video. Okay, so here is, and this is again famous, I think this all goes all the way back to Dirac, but certainly... Um, Wheeler talked about this, and, and Feynman and plenty of other people did this demonstration. So here is a belt, okay, a little strip. Let me try to get it in the video. Uh, I need to remember to make the video big enough so you can see this. But it's a band, okay, that has two ends, and these two ends represent the positions of two identical particles, okay? So now we have a two-particle system. And you can see that I'm holding them in a certain orientation so that there's no twists in the band. I'm not doing anything, not, nothing up my sleeve. Uh, it looks like a little bent if I hold them like this, but there's no twist in it like that, okay? What I'm going to do is not rotate either particle, but I will interchange them, okay? So I'm not allowed to do this, all right? I'm not gonna do that. I'm just gonna interchange the two particles with each other, boom. And what you notice is that now there is a twist in the band. That is a topological fact, and I could go back into the topology of that. Hopefully it's visible against my shirt, etc. But there is now a twist in the band, if you can see it, okay? And what I want to argue is that I can undo the twist by rotating one of the particles. So this, this 
twist got in there when I interchanged the two particles, okay? So I did the thing that if they're fermions, connects them to each other. And now I'm saying that by taking one particle, the one in my right hand here, and by rotating it by 360 degrees, I can undo the twist. So watch this. I do it 180, still a twist, 360 degrees, bang. There is now no longer a twist, okay? If you can see that. So what I claim to prove, or at least, you know, hand wavily argue in favor of, is that for fermions, for things that obey the, the rules of the belt over here, um, interchange, the, by which I mean the effect on the quantum wave function of interchanging two identical particles, can be undone by rotating one particle by 360 degrees. That's what the belt is supposed to show. I can undo the topological twist I put in the belt by rotating one of the particles, not both of them, just one by 360 degrees. But we know that four fermions interchange picks up a minus sign. Therefore, uh, the, the fermions are going to be particles where when you rotate one of them, you better pick up a minus sign when you rotate one of them by 360 degrees. And guess what? That is, boy, I hope I wrote this down. Um, yep, I don't know if I did write this down. Yes, there we go. <laughs> uh, the, the field, which has the property that when you rotate it by 360 degrees, you pick up a minus sign is a spinner, is a spin one half particle. So therefore, again, don't, don't think about this too hard. You know, just be inspired by it. Don't, don't lean on it in times of trouble. Um, therefore, fermions are spinners. I'll write spin one half, and which I mean, I'm gonna include three halves. I didn't talk about spin three halves, et cetera, but you could do the same thing for those. That's the spin statistics theorem. See, that wasn't so hard, also the completely bogus uh, proof that is that is offered you. But that's the spirit of it, it really is. That, that's the kind of argument that goes into it. That's the ultimate reason why deep down it is. Um, and that, in turn, is the reason why I can build a table out of atoms. Because atoms get their size and shape from electrons. Electrons are spin one half, therefore they are fermions, therefore they take up space. It takes too much energy to squish them, that is why tables are solid. So this again, you know, just to again take things back to previous videos, there's this pernicious idea out there that atoms are mostly empty space. That can't be true. If atoms were mostly empty space, tables would not be solid. Like if atoms were really little solar systems, you could totally squish them. <laughs> the reason you can't is because atoms are not empty space, because the electron's wave function defines the size of the atom. And it's not empty, it has a wave function there. And it's taking up space, and something cannot squish right on top of it. There are subtleties here, of course, because what I proved, I didn't prove anything at all, but what I, what I said was the exclusion principle, that you can't have two electrons in exactly the same quantum state. What I'm deriving, what I'm implying from that, is that if you get them close to the same quantum state, they push back in a kind of force. In fact, this is, uh, well, in, in certain contexts, this is known as Fermi pressure. In some cases, it's even Fermi degeneracy pressure if you're in a neutron star or a white dwarf or something like that. But this is the pressure you get from fermions pushing back on each other because of the exclusion principle. And people want to say, you know, is, it, is this a new force of nature? Does this count? And I, as, I, as I alluded to in a previous video, who cares is the answer to that. It's perfectly, you know, the, the idea that we separate um, the things going on in nature into particles and forces is an antiquated idea. You should have gotten rid of that, you know, decades and decades ago. What we have are quantum fields obeying the equation of motion, which is ultimately the Schrodinger equation with the Hamiltonian for the standard model of particle physics, okay? So it's a force-like thing, the Fermi pressure. It is the thing that pushes back on you when you pushes your hand, when you push your hand on the table. Uh, but what I like is, you know, it's just another example, a really nice example of how these abstract ideas in quantum field theory filter up into the everyday world. We've, we've sort of, this is another payoff video in the sense that we've closed the circle. Uh, it was many videos ago we talked about the fact that a smart 
physicists in the year 1899 could have thought that soon we would understand all of nature in terms of particles and forces acting on them. We know better now, it's all just quantum mechanics and one big wave function. But that wave function can be thought of as describing fields that are either fermions and bosons, and there's a close relationship between the fermions in quantum field theory and the matter particles that our 18th century physicists would have guessed, and the bosons in quantum field theory and the forces. So the universe does ultimately make sense, if not always for the reasons you might initially have guessed.